Good evening, everyone. Good evening. This evening's event celebrates the creation of a new lecture series. The Carmen R. and Joseph G. Schneidler Lectures on Asian Studies. The <laughs> series honors the parents of Stephanie Schneidler. Stephanie and her husband, Jeff Robinson, have been not only wise advisors and generous supporters of UT Dallas and especially the Center for Asian Studies, they are an irresistible, charming force on behalf of knowledge, beauty, and a sense of each of our larger duty to humankind. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Stephanie, for your impact on education. That impact, like the value that Abby and I place on our friendship, is beyond my meager powers to describe. <laughs> you and me, and Steph, would you stand up? Go ahead, Shaiwa. Uh, Jeff. It's an especially inspiring honor to welcome Chitra Banerjee Divakariti as the inaugural speaker. I first met Chitra almost 15 years ago when we had a public conversation uh, as part of Richardson Reed's one book about her novel, One Amazing Thing. We've kept in touch over the years, and I've read not all, but three or four or five lately of her, is it 18 published novels? 21 published novels. That's by spirit speaking. Uh, I it's been a special I have two of hers that are my they're my absolute favorites and uh, people will know why because I'm a classicist. I'm especially enthralled by her gracefully subversive reimagining and retelling of the two great Indian epics, the Mahabharata, uh, the novel was Palace of Illusions and the Ramayana in the, in the novel Forest of Enchantment. You know, Forest of Enchantment might be the best description of her complex, insightful, enchanting mind. Of her novel Independence, I will simply say, please buy and read this novel. Uh, it's a step beyond what even Chitra has been able to do. It's, a, it's enchanting, it's disruptive, it's inspiring. I cried the second time I read it. The essence of art. So how to introduce Chitra Diva Karubi? A novelist whose works exhibit an out, almost outrageous imagination, directed by fierce intelligence, a poet, a teacher, an activist on behalf of women. In the words of one of our earlier speakers, a legend. The best I can do to introduce Chitra Banerjee Diva Karuni as the first lecturer of the Carmen R. and Joseph G. Schneider series is to use her own words. Adapted. Ladies and gentlemen, one amazing woman. Thank you very much, Dr. Kratz, for that more than generous introduction. And thank you to all of you for being here today. Can everyone hear me? The mic is not on. Can we try this one more time? Yes? Okay. So, but you heard what I said. But I'll say it again. Thank you so much, Dr. Kratz. You have just been wonderful to this entire process of getting me here. I wanted to start by saying I am so 
honored to be part of the Asian Studies Program Lectures, and I'm very honored to be the inaugural lecture. And it has been postponed due to family reasons, but I'm very delighted that this week the weather gods cooperated and I could be here. And thank you all of you for joining me. <laughs> I wanted to say just a few words about why is it important to have a program like Asian Studies. It is, and why is it more important perhaps than ever before in America, in the United States today? I think um, we are facing a country that is sadly divided and a country that looks on difference as something that is to be feared, mistrusted, pushed aside. And this um, reminds me of a book that I read many years ago when I was in college, and that you may well know, a very inspiring book, Maya Angelou's autobiography, the very first one she wrote called I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And there's a moment there where the family has been through a terrible racist incident and the child asks the old uncle, why do they hate us? And the uncle says something that has stayed with me ever since and perhaps made me into a writer. The uncle says, they don't know us. And a program like Asian Studies fights against that ignorance. It enables people to know us, and therefore, to move forward beyond the barrier that is created by not knowing, not understanding, and therefore fearing. So it is my great hope that the Asian Studies program here will make this community one that comes together. People from various different backgrounds, learning about each other, knowing each other, sharing about each other, and I'm very, very happy to be a small part of it. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about this book, a little bit about why I wrote the novel Independence, which is, as you might imagine, about India's independence struggle, and especially the years of independence, the years just before and the years just after. This book is different from many other books that Indian writers have written about independence, especially in English. Most of those books talk about independence as it occurred on the northern border, partition as it occurred on the northern border in the Punjab region. And that was truly a terrible experience with much bloodshed. But people forget that at this time, when the British divided India into three, there was another border, and that was on the eastern side in Bengal, which is where I come from. And the story of the people of Bengal as they underwent partition and independence has really not been told much, has really not been discussed in English. And I really wanted to write about that. And I had a personal reason. My mother had told me stories. My grandfather had told me stories. They had lived through independence. They had lived through partition. They had been in Kolkata when wonderful and terrible things were happening, when there were great inspiring incidents and terrifying massacres going on. And so I wanted to capture all of that as much as I could in this book, this is fictional, but it's really based on a lot of true stories. And I wanted to do that because so many people either are forgetting or have forgotten or don't even know about Indian independence. In this country especially, I feel many people do not know about the struggle of India and how many people sacrificed so much to gain independence. Although, in many ways, India and the United States are similar in that they overthrew the British yoke and gained their freedom. 
So I feel that there's a real need, and a real need today, as I was saying, <coughs> when we are so divided as a nation, to have a book that maybe shows the importance of unity, the importance of overcoming what we perceive as differences, differences of language, differences of culture, differences of class and caste, and differences, I don't know, all kinds of differences, differences of ideology. And this is such an important moment for us to see what brings us together and really not focus on the ways in which we can make our differences tear us apart. Because difference itself does not tear people apart. It's what we do with it that tears people apart. I wanted to write this book for Indian readers in India as well, because as you might know, India is age-wise a very young country. And when I've been going there to give talks in recent years, I find that most of my audience, they were born post-independence, as was I. They were born into a free India. So we have always taken for granted the wonderful freedom that India has. And we haven't thought about how did this freedom come about, and also what were the mistakes made that caused about one million people to die in that one year around partition. So it is a story I feel that is very important for us to remember and recall because as I'm sure you all know, those who are ignorant, those who choose to be ignorant of history are often doomed to repeat it. And we don't want that. We don't want, already the world is so divided in so many ways. We want to remember what is the price that is paid when we choose not to see our commonalities, not to come together in a common purpose, which will enrich everyone, and instead focus on the differences. So those are some of the reasons I wrote this book. Um, this is the story Unlike many of my other books, and Dr. Katz very kindly mentioned Palace of Delusions and Forest of Enchantments, which are retellings of our epics. And the people in there, yes, they are human, they are ordinary, but really they are heroes. They are, you know, they are larger than life people. They are larger than life beings, I should say. And although I wanted to show their humanity, it's really a whole different kind of person. But here, the main characters are three sisters. When, when the story begins, this is before independence and before a huge event that will occur to change their lives. They're just pretty much teenagers. They're 18, 19, 20. And they live lives that teenage girls live. So they're thinking about, you know, makeup. They're thinking about shopping. They're thinking about what career shall I have? They're, they're thinking about things of that kind. And when they're impelled into history, their lives change, their lives are transformed. So this is a book about how all of us as ordinary beings can look inside and find the strength to deal with what history presents to us. And so, you know, and, and as with much of my writing, the main characters are these three sisters. They are women. As Dr. Katz said, it, is, it has been long been a project of mine to focus my writing on women, to focus, to make us think about what women's lives are like, what their challenges are like, what makes them heroic, and because they are human and flawed, what makes them sometimes the opposite of heroic? I think we all can learn from this. I wanted to say a little bit about the writing process of this book. This book, every book comes to me differently. And for each one, the writing process is different. And sometimes, you know, I teach creative writing at the University of Houston, which I'm, I'm delighted to say is a wonderful writing program. And uh, so my students sometimes say, well, you know, once you write a book, do you like know how to do it? And it's just going to be, is it like 
riding a bicycle, you learn it and you never forget it. And I'm like, I'm sorry to tell you, that isn't how it looks with each book because it's different. You have to learn all over again how to write this particular book. And when I was writing this one, um, I started with thinking about the three sisters and how they were each equally important, though they were very different. So I started writing their story in first person. So I'd give a chapter to the oldest, Deepa, then the middle one, Jamini, then the youngest one, Priya, and each one would start off by saying, I, like my story. And at a certain point, that was just not satisfying to me. I felt that that really limited the story. So I started, I moved to the third person, but it was still from the sister's point of view. So, you know, now we are seeing through Deepa's eyes, and Deepa is doing this, or Jamini is doing this, Priya is doing this, but we're very close to their heads, as it were, we're just behind them. And I wrote some more, and um, you know, things were coming along well. I kind of knew the, the arc of the story. That's a magical moment in writing when you know what's going to happen, uh, at least for the next few chapters. Uh, my books always surprise me, because every time I think I've got the whole arc of the plot, something else comes up. But at least, you know, I was moving right along, and then one day, now, a lot of my epiphanies take place when I'm in the gym. And uh, I have to say, my husband, Murthy, my wonderful husband, very supportive, Murthy, without whom I wouldn't be here today because he literally drove me here. So thank you. <laughs> All your support. So Murthy and I go to the gym, and I get on the treadmill, and I go into a kind of trance. You know, I'm doing my treadmill, and I'm just, my mind just kind of, go somewhere and story ideas come to me, right? So I'm doing my treadmill and then suddenly this idea comes to me. But it's a terrible idea. I mean, it's a wonderful but terrible idea because it shows me that I've done this wrong. And I'm like, whoa, what am I going to do now? Because it's not the story of the three sisters alone. It's the story of India and we have to be able to see what's happening elsewhere in the country. So I have to have an omniscient third person voice at least part of the time. And so I go to, um, so I write, rewrite a chapter and I rewrite a beginning and I have these little sections in the beginnings of each part of the book. And I rewrite the first, I write the first one and I send it to my uh, editor because the book has now been sold in the US and in India and I have wonderful editors, and I say, this is the idea I got, and what do you think of it? And they both write back to me and they say, it's making the book much better, it's making it larger, it's making it more, making it more universal, we love this voice, but you still have to meet the deadline, which is in like four months. <laughs> I'm going to have to rewrite this whole thing. So luckily it's summer and I just I literally I sit in the recliner all day and much of all night and I rewrite this whole book it's like the words just come to me at this point so I'm going to read to you that voice which came to me which I trusted and which ultimately I was very happy with so you will see that in the beginning of each part there is a little section and it's a little section that's in italics. And if you do what Dr. Katz said and get your own book, you will be able to see it up close <laughs> and read it also. But this, this is what came to me. And it was like a bird's eye view of India, of what was going on in this little place in Bengal, in this village, yes, in the city of Kolkata, yes, but also everywhere else. And as um, the book continued and we moved from part one into parts two, three, four, etc. Time moved, we began to see more of the things that were happening at once, exciting and terrible. August, 1946. Here is a river, like a slender silver chain. Here is a village bordered by green gold rice fields. Here is a breeze, 
smelling of sweet water rushes. Here is the marble balcony of a grand old mansion with guards at its iron gates and servants transporting trays of delicacies up the stairs. Here are a man and a woman in carved teak chairs. Here is the country that contains them all. The river is Sharshi. The village is Ranipur in Bengal. The mansion belongs to Shonath Chaudhary, Zamindar. He is playing chess with Priya, daughter of his best friend, Nabukumar Ganguly. The country is India. The year is 1946. The month is August. Everything is about to change. And this is literally true because in August of 1946, Jinnah, who was the Muslim leader in India at that time, calls for a particular political action called a direct action day, where it will be a strike, no one will work, everyone will come together, uh, the Muslims will all come together, they will band together, and there will be talks about <coughs> where India needs to go. And in much of India, that is what happened. There were talks, people discussed, you know, people got enthusiastic about having a new country for themselves, Pakistan. They were discussing this. But in Calcutta, it turned into the most terrible riots. And a huge amount of killing occurred during this time. And um, that is where the book will begin, just before that. Um, I know about this because my mother lived through that time. She was in Calcutta during that time. And I put a sentence into this book, which I'll read later, which is directly like what she told me. So, um, you know, direct action day. I'm going to start, though, a little before direct action day. There are, and I'll tell you a little bit about the three sisters. So the oldest Deepa is the most beautiful one. And what she dreams of is to make a fine match, to marry someone who will bring um, money to the family, who will bring a good reputation to the family. She feels that if she does that, that will really, that is a good thing she can do for her family and her younger sisters. The second sister, Jamini, is a strange one. She was the most complex and most difficult one to write. And what she, and Jamini's problem is that of the middle child. If there are any middle children here, maybe you will relate. After I wrote this book, like 500 People wrote to me and they were all middle children and they said, you've got her problem just right. Ignored by the father, ignored by the mother. Everyone loves the first one, everyone loves the baby. I'm like forgotten. Well, that's Jamini's um, situation. So Jamini wants to be loved. She wants to be loved and she's willing to do almost anything to be loved. Priya, their father is a doctor and from young, from a young age, Priya has wanted to become a doctor. Now, at this time, it was very difficult in India for a woman to become a doctor. And women were not allowed into the medical college, but she's determined. And her father, who knows all this, is determined not to let her become one. Anyway, this is their story. I will read a little bit about Calcutta as it was before Direct Action Day, because I think only then will people realize what happens on direct action day. So the girls have been telling, asking their father, uh, can we please go to the city of Kolkata? They live in a little village. They, they really want to see Kolkata. And they're like, can we please go to New Market? Now, New Market is the big, if anyone's at all familiar with Kolkata, you know, it, it is and was. And so for like many, many years, it was the major shopping area. It was a place where there were like more shops than I could certainly have imagined. And all this time, it had been closed to Indians, but only recently has it been opened up. Before this, only the, only the British could go and shop there. 
other than you know the storekeepers were Indian, but Indians were not allowed to shop there. But now it's opened up. So the girls are like, can we please go shopping? So I'm gonna read you that portion because you know that's a happy moment when, you know, like we all know this. If we've ever had something terrible suddenly happen, the moment before that, we don't know it's coming. We are in a whole other mental space. That's what the girls are. So they've just gotten to new market. Stepping out, they are engulfed by flowers. This is the outdoor pool bazaar, Nabukumar, their father, says. Buckets of bouquets in every color and size, marigold and rose garlands for Hindu weddings, lily wreaths for Christian funerals. They step through an entrance that, until a couple of years ago, was closed to Indians. Inside, hundreds of shops crowd along labyrinthine passageways lit by electric lights as though it were nighttime. Indeed, it is easy to confuse night and day in this magical space. This is in the point of view of Jamini. Whatever Jamini thinks of, makeup, jewelry, decorations, cookware, furniture, fruits, nuts, pickles, medicine, it materializes around the next bend. There are even shops shamelessly displaying ladies' underwear. Bina, their mother, gathers up armloads of silk thread for wedding kathas. I have to pause here a moment. I forgot to tell you that Bina is a great quilter. She makes Bengali quilts. They're called kathas. It's a particular stitch that as, as girls, we all had to learn it. It's not a difficult stitch, but it's difficult to make it into beautiful works of art. However, I have several kathas to my credit, which have been put away far away into wardrobes and drawers. But I have worn for you today a kanta shari, right? A sari, which has the kanta stitch, because I want you to see how beautiful this is. And Bina is a master maker of these quilts. Her quilts are bought by people in the village and other villages, and um, you know she hopes to sell them in Kolkata, finally. That's one of the reasons they've come to Calcutta. Vina <clears throat> gathers up armloads of silk thread for wedding kathas. Expensive, but it will pay for itself once she sells the quilts. Deepa asks Navakumar for face powder and daringly lipstick. Priya wants a baby monkey from the exotic animals market, <laughs> but after a look at Vina's face, settles for letter writing paper, though she has no one to write to. And now, Omit insists on selecting the design for her of the letter paper, an edging of black battleships that Jamini considers quite ugly. Nevertheless, Jamini, aside from me, she's in love with, with Omit, who is in love with Priya. Okay, this is going to become very interesting. I won't say, say anymore. We have to get the book. Yeah. Um, yes. That Jamini considers quite ugly. Nevertheless, she asks him to pick out a silk flower hair clip for her. Fortunately, he chooses a pink rose that she quite likes. And now, for the best part, Nabukumar announces, and Ami, with whom he must plant this, cries, Nahomes. They refuse to explain. Anyone here who's from Kolkata knows about Nahomes, and then now everyone else will also. They refuse to explain, so the women follow them curiously down more narrow, twisting passages to the other end of the market. They smell Nahum's before they see it, because Nahum's is a bakery, one of the oldest and most popular in Calcutta, Omid says. The counter is crowded with customers. By their clothes, Jamini can tell the Christians from the Muslims, the Jews from the Hindus. What an amazing city is this Calcutta, where they can all rub elbows and think nothing of it. The glass cases are filled with glistening items, plum cake, fruit cake, cheese cake, heart cake, chicken puff, cheese puff, rum ball. Deepa chooses a cream puff and licks her fingers. Priya says her heart-shaped cake is soft as a cloud. Omid chooses a slice of fruit cake 
So Germany decides on the same. The dark, dense slab is bitter, peels mixed in among the dried food, but she chews on it industriously and insists that she has never tasted anything as wonderful. I should just say as an aside that just a couple of weeks back, there was a post, there was a very popular post on Twitter where they had a photo of Nahum's and they said exactly what I wrote, that this is still a place where you will find people from all backgrounds. And I wanted to put it in the book because, you know, that was, that to me showed the spirit of India, where everybody came together to enjoy and to, you know, to just eat each other's kinds of food. food. Anyway. So, but the next day is direct action day. They're going to stay home. They're not going to go anywhere. They say they will relax and then they'll come back to New Market. They'll try to sell a quilt and they'll go back. But direct action day happens. It's crazy. Like, riots break out. People are dying everywhere. Nama Kumar is a doctor. He has a clinic in Kolkata. And his partner in the clinic is Dr. Abdullah. They went to medical college together. They've opened this pretty much a free clinic for poor people. And he calls Dr. Abdullah and he says, why don't you come and stay where we're staying? He's staying with a very well-to-do friend, Amit's father, in his house. And he says, it's very safe here. We have guards with guns and you can just come here. But Abdullah says, I'm going to the clinic because people are dying, they're injured, they've come to the clinic, my nephew is over there and he can't handle it himself, I'm going. And then Nama Kumar says, well then, I can't leave you there in that danger, I'm going too. And everyone tries to stop him, but he says, I'm going. He gets there, he gets there without trouble, he just you know, walks through the dark and gets there. But then they get a phone call and Dr. Abdullah calls and says that you know there were people at the door begging to be let in and screaming in pain. And your father went out there to get them and he got shot, he got caught in the crossfire. And when they hear it, Veena and the girls say, but well, we have to go and see him because he might be dying. And Veena especially says, I can't just let him go and sit here safely. So I'm going to read to you the section that shows them going through the city to the clinic. It's not very far, but it is through mixed neighborhoods, some Hindu, some Muslim. And they are, this is a Hindu family. Dr. Abdullah's family is a Muslim family. He sends his nephew to help them through. His name is Raza, and he brings burqas for the women to wear. So when they're going through the Muslim areas, they will look like Muslim women. Now they hurry down the alley, and this is in Priya's point of view. Six of them stepping shadow to shadow, startling at every sound. Raza in front, Amit behind, the women huddled in the center. Raza had brought a skull cap from Amit, for Amit, and for the women, burkas that belong to Nurse Salima. They will be safer this way because they're crossing a Muslim neighborhood. Priya's burqa smells of clove and garlic. Through its net veil, the world shimmers, unreal. Deepa supports Veena. Jamini clutches Priya's hand damply. Priya hears Veena whisper. She's telling Nabukumar to hold on until she arrives. So they're passing through the roads, and there's like death everywhere. There's dead bodies all around. And you know, they're terrified. They're going through this and they're terrified. And Priya's thinking, oh, thank God, there's no one on the road. The rioting seems to have moved on to another part of the city. Even as Priya thinks this, a group of men comes around the corner. Seeing Veena's small party, they begin to run towards them with frenzied yells. Their leader wields a sword. His forehead is streaked with vermilion, a Hindu mob. The girls are frozen. Raza and Amit take a stand in front of them, hands fisted, but they look dismayed. The men are carrying rods and knives. One wields an axe. Then, Veena, the mother, how 
is she able to think so calmly, so clearly, removes her burqa and drops it to the ground. She orders her daughters to do the same. She pulls the caps off Raza's and Amit's heads and throws them down too. She pushes Raza behind Amit. Then she joins her palms and speaks loudly, addressing the leader. Dada, Goddess Kali herself must have sent you. My children and I are trying to get to my husband, a doctor who was badly wounded, trying to save lives tonight. He's in the clinic down the road. Will you help us get there? The leader is taken aback. One of his men points to the burqas and whispers. Bina says, we were scared to come through the Muslim neighborhoods, so we disguised ourselves. But see, we are Hindu. She looks the leader in the face and holds up her hands. The leader notes the marriage sindur, crimson on the parting of Bina's hair, the iron and conch shell bangles on her arms. The men mutter among themselves. Finally, the leader nods, very well. I will take you to the clinic, but do not venture out again. The next group you meet might not be so kind. Follow us, quickly now. We have much to accomplish tonight. Priya shudders to think what these accomplishments may be. Still, for the moment, these men are their saviors. So they're going through the, the blood-soaked streets, and they finally get to the clinic. At last, the clinic enters. The mob melts into the night. Raza knocks on the door, calls to his uncle. His voice shakes. Is he thinking the same thing that keeps running through Priya's head? If the mob had realized he was Muslim, he would not be standing here now. The rest of them might be dead, too. Dr. Abdullah cracks open the door. Hurry, hurry. Just before Priya ducks inside, something makes her look up. And the next sentences are what my mother told me of her, from her memories. The sky is a dull red. Calcutta is burning. And I will stop here. Thank you. Those easy questions you have uh, oh. I'm just fascinated by the book. And at the moment, I'm having a flashback to 15 years ago when we're sitting and talking. Um, but, but first, I, I, really, they're not so much questions as sharing with you my experience in reading the novel. Um, and you, you've shared basically what's going on. There are these three sisters. And I had an immediate thought, and please feel free to tell that the assembled crowd, including my students, how dumb this is. Um, you've got Priya, who is fiercely intelligent, really smart, and wants to be a physician, as all the fiercely smart students I know want to do. Then you have Deepa, who's beautiful, and she's also a good singer. Okay, because that comes. To and then so you have intelligence, beauty, and then Jamini, who you set up as. Um, there's one chapter you begin um, that Jamini looked up and she said, "Okay, Priya takes care of intelligence. Um, Deepa's got beauty." She chose goodness. I almost see these as allegorical figures. Um, there are, it's, it sounds like I asked you to write it. Uh, in my view, there are, you know, there are three great domains of human cognition. Um, there's art, which is um, singing and beauty, and that's deeper. There's intelligence, which is Priya, and a scientific kind of intelligence. And then there's um, Jasmine, who has a bum leg, 
and doesn't think of herself as pretty, and she chose she chooses service and goodness and duty. So it seems to me you've almost set up as a medievalist what the ideal country needs. Yes, and also in creating these characters, I went back to a kind of literature that I love and that I'm very fond of, which is folklore, fairy tales, mm -hmm. fantasy, right? In which we often have three sisters, right? Because three is the destabilizing number. Yeah. Right? If they're two, they kind of stick together because they have each other. But three <clears throat> messes things up. Yeah, and then, well, then you blow it all to smithereens. And then they all change, right? And, and they and, all yes. mingle and, to each other. They learn um, from each other in some ways. But I still see them as idealized notions of we, you know, for, and I'm thinking India sounds a lot like America at this point. Um, you need intelligence, practical intelligence, scientific knowledge. You need people with a sense of duty, and you certainly need the arts. Um, now, to write it for this school, you would have needed a technology version. Um, but, but Priya is the, you know, she's, it, the, it's, 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 she's the handy one in the household. And, and yet, um, kind of like me. Huh? I'm the handy one in my household. <laughs> <laughs> Murthy Mur Mur does some other wonderful things very well. Yeah. But, you know, when there's, when there's like a, a leak in the plumbing, I'm the one under the sink. <laughs> like Priya. <laughs> Your house is very much like my house. Um, <laughs> so then you take them and they become people. And they're, I can't tell, I don't want to ruin it. There's so much that they go through. They're, they're jealousies of the, loving the same person. There's Priya going, having to go to America because it's so hard and so unfair to be a physician. Yeah, she, uh, can't go to, she can't go to medical school in India, oh. so yeah, yeah, someone will send her to It America. really is kind of like a fairy tale. Um, and I kept hoping for a happy ending. Well, I think the ending is happy. We won't give it away, yeah. but it's not the conventional happy ending. It's for those who know Indian cinema, it's not the Bollywood ending. <laughs> <laughs> this is the tease. Um, but yeah, I, I kept wondering how... How's she gonna do? How's she gonna handle this? How's uh, how, how what's Chitra gonna do next? I love that part of reading. Yeah, well, I was writing the story. I was kind of thinking the same thing. Well, how's she gonna handle this? Because I don't always know the endings of my stories. They reveal themselves to me as I write more. I I just know a little more, and then a little more. So I didn't know how the story was going to end. But I trusted. I trusted that the story would reveal itself. And Deepa, who falls in love with a Muslim with Rasa, man, right. and th that caught me really powerfully because of all of the deception involved. It was a very dangerous thing at that time. Yeah. It Is it still that way? Do you know In parts of India, I think it's still dangerous. It depends on the family, it depends on the town you come from. Not so much in the large urban centers, but you know, recently, in the, in the small towns recently and, there have been cases. In America, I've been, I've been reading that, um, that people are, are less, uh, less worried about what marrying somebody of a different religion <laughs> than they are about marrying somebody of a different political party. Well, <laughs> that, could, that could become very dangerous at this point, especially when it is so divided. You know? But there's, there's this wonderful deceit that goes on when she can't quite give up, and she doesn't want to give up her identity. That's, uh, and neither do. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just a stunningly, stunningly interesting Thank to you. me. Um, and particularly what you do with the music, that both Deepa and Jasmine have beautiful singing voices. And I have to confess, I reread the novel the other, uh, not so long ago. Um, 
And yeah, I wanted to say a, something about the music. Yeah. Uh, this it was really important for me to put the music of the time into the book, and the music is especially accurate because it was a huge part of the freedom struggle. Mm -hmm. And there were these songs, especially songs of Tagore, who comes from a Hindu background, and songs of Nazrul Islam, who comes from a Muslim background. And they were singing, they were creating these freedom songs and people would sing them and they would be inspired to resist the British. And so the British outlawed these songs. You could not sing them. And people would still sing them. They would go on these freedom marches and sing them, and they would be beaten up, and they'd be thrown into jail, and they'd still be singing them. So it was very inspiring for everyone. And so those songs are in this book. And um, my Indian publisher did a wonderful thing, and they created a playlist, which you can get on the internet, of all of these songs. And I really, really do, mm -hmm. um, I recommend, I ask that you should at least listen to one or two of those songs because they're it's very inspiring and they're they're truly timeless. Could you enlighten me um, and, and maybe others uh, about the role of Robin Dronoff Tagore in contemporary Indian culture? The first speaker, as you know, that we had in the series right. was Jai Chakrabarti, mm -hmm. who's novel turned on a Tagore play that was performed during the Holocaust and then in, in India. Um, I don't think it's possible to read an Indian novel without a reference to Tagore. Well, he was, so and what, continues what is his role? to be, he is just, he continues to be such a central and seminal figure. I think all the Indians in the audience would agree that, you know, we grew up reading him, listening to his music, being familiar with his ideas. He was truly a polymath, very worth looking up. And he was a citizen of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, he also was a great educationalist because he created mm. um, a university unlike anything that was, yeah. I, I really think, in the world at that time, Shanti Niketan, which continues. And where he was very environmentally conscious, the classes would take home. Uh, place out of doors, they were very in sync with the changing seasons, and he invited people from all over the world to come and teach there. So, you know, and he was greatly, he was uh, admired by many leaders, including Nehru and Gandhi, and you know, so he was, he was like, he was not alive anymore, he had passed away by this time, but his spirit kind of led people on towards independence. Gandhiji's favorite song, which he often sang when he went on his marches, is Atla Chaudhuri, which, which says basically, if no one will join you, then you must walk alone. There's, on page 25, the, the new Tagore song that comes on. And usually Tagore is too high-minded for Deepa, she prefers catchy romantic songs. But something about this one haunts her, and this poem haunts me. Now here's the Tagore poem. On this wild, windy day, my wild mind awakens. I do not know why it longs to go beyond the known world where there are no roads. Will it ever return home? I, Two nights ago, I was preparing my, my class. I'm teaching science fiction. Um, and I came across a quote from Stephen Hawking, who said that the essence of human is that even though we're limited physically, and that he has particularly in his case, our mind can go beyond any known limits. Um, that reminded me of a statement, forgive all the classicist, by Lucretius in praising Epicurus, who said, he didn't listen to the fables. His mind broke the limits, and he traveled the world in his mind. Mm -hmm. um, and it just seems to me that, you know, you know when you read, I tell us that you connected in ways you don't expect it. All of, the, all of them, 
didn't want to observe their imaginative limits. Yeah, the three sisters definitely, they, and they change, right? In, in the beginning, their lives are very limited, but at a certain point, it explodes. And I think it's the same with the country, because for you know more than 200 years, the British had been telling them, you cannot be free. And finally, they went beyond those limits. They imagined a free yeah. India, and then it happened. It hit me reading that. That's one of the, one of the reasons I love your novels so much is they really are science fictional in that way. They're, everyone I've read is about somebody who's not going to live within her limits. And they're usually women. Um, Ladies? <laughs> yes, a little applause for it's, it. It's OK. Thank you. Thank you. But really, it's you know, Sita. Uh, and you're me telling the Ramayana just basically says, I'm not putting up with this crap. You know, to, and, and, and you changed the story in, in a magnificent way, I thought. Well, you know, when you're in, uh, Dr. Katz is talking about my novel, Forest of Enchantments. What's interesting, if you really read the many versions of the uh -huh. line that exist, I haven't changed any of mm -hmm. the actions. Everything that happens yeah. in my novel is there in either Valmiki or one of the right. other versions, like Prithibas. Um, but I've changed how she thinks Season. about it. Right? <coughs> but we don't ever know in the other versions how she thinks about it, because it's always told from a male's omniscient gaze. But here, I've imagined what she must be thinking as she goes through all of this, just as I'm imagining what these sisters are thinking. I don't want to what monopolize is. your time, but I know there would be some questions. Yes. I just want to make one last, yes. one last very personal comment, so please don't listen. Um, <laughs> the, the father, the, the doctor dies, I'm sorry to say. Okay. He dies heroically because he can't not go out onto what was a battlefield of the street to save people. But as I was reading that, it resonated in a strange way. Uh, my father passed away when I was 19. And that's just about the age of just a, so I'm reading this. And there's a quote from Yu Hua, the Chinese novelist, who said the amazing thing about literature is somebody from another culture, writing in another language, from another era, can put something on a page and resonate immediately and take take hold of you. You caught the dynamics of the family in that situation in a way that uh, it was one of the places that brought me to tears. Thank so, and that's what writers, thank you, that's what writers do. You see thank a deeper you. truth. So, questions, comments from the audience. I mean, thank you for putting up with, with, with uh, this conversation. We've wanted to have this conversation. Fifteen years. Uh, first question. Yes. Questions, comments, and praises also accepted. <laughs> <laughs> that excerpt you read was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and oh, I, and I okay. Enjoyed. Before you ask your question, I I wanted to read at the end of our our discussion the very final part. So this is after I have finished the novel. I've sent it to my publisher. They are actually getting ready to print it, and. Suddenly, this comes to me, these lines, there are like five lines here, and exactly these words, and I have to immediately write them down and send them to my publisher and say, stop the presses, this has to be here, because this is really important. And this is the postscript. Here is a river, here is a wind rising, here is a village, here is the year. The river is time ebbing, Flooding. The wind is memory. It can carry flowers. It can carry flames. The village is the world, and you are at its center. The year is now. What will you do with it? What will you be? And this is addressed to all the readers. All of you. Thank you. Uh, my question is about your writing process. 
And I was curious how your sense of identity uh, helped you with this book or maybe struggled in any way, uh, helped or, or made it harder? You know, that's a great question. It's a little of both, right? Because I had a personal connection to the material, then I could write about it with more passion, but it also made it more difficult because I wanted to make sure that I still had an objective view of what was going on and that I could still do the research responsibly and also write for people who did not have this connection that I had to the material. Because if it didn't work for them, then the book is not successful. So, you know, I was torn in two, writing both for those who know and feel that time, that material, that experience, and those who have no idea of it whatsoever. So was it purely historical uh, in nature, or you know, did you uh, somehow see yourself you know, living in America today, and does that somehow connect both, to the book? Both, yes, yes, because in some ways, I'm writing the book. When I write the book, and my students often ask me, well, we talk about audience a lot. Who are we writing the book for? And I tell them that on some level, you have to just write the book and not think about the audience. But if otherwise, the material becomes polluted by our thoughts of the audience who's reading it, who may require explanations or not wish for explanations. So we, just have to think of the book and what makes it a good book. But of course, thoughts of audience at some point during the editing process, if not earlier, will seep in. So I think those were things I struggled with. As a writer living in the United States, writing for people here as well as for people in India, which is, you know, the books are brought out in India and a lot of people read them, and in other countries as well. So. You know, the question of audience is always an, it's a complicated question in my mind. But ultimately, I have to go back to what I tell my students, which is, can't think about the audience while writing. Got to think about the story. Thank you. Talk, thank you. Um, you've chosen a political event, which isn't a hundred years old, old or it's, it's what, eight, something like that. Yeah. This Those book came people, out in the 75th year of India's independence. But, but I timed it for that. It strikes me that political events like that take on a mytholog mythological status in your mind. What I see as the myth of America when I was growing up are totally being shut down now. Is that happening? for Indians, like particularly Indians in the United States, having to deal with different ways of thinking about the founding of India as a state. And does that affect how you think about the history as a writer? You know, that is a complex question because I can't claim to speak for all Indians in the US, right? I can only speak for myself and maybe what I have observed, which is that, and that is one of the reasons I wrote this because people have forgotten or they have distorted these older historical events. And like I said in the beginning, if we don't realize where we did well with independence and where we did terribly with partition, then we could very well relive it. I think all over the world, there is a dangerous spirit of divisiveness there is an, it's in the air, it's here in the United States, it's there in India. And if we don't understand what divisiveness does to us, then we leap into it. So, you know, that's why this book is important to me. And I hope that the story will speak to others and allow people to see this issue. Sometimes, sometimes you know, we read things and because books are 
in some ways, they're very gentle. They are not also, but they're very gentle in that they invite you into them without, you know, in a gentle way. You can just, it's an intimate experience. The book and I, as it were. And so we're often willing to learn from books what we wouldn't want to listen to if someone was telling us those things. And that's the power of books. The books can also be dangerous and violent. And one of my favorite quotes about books, which I hope my books also do, is by Kafka, who says, a book should be the ax to shatter the frozen sea that is inside you. And I love that. I like it. Yes, uh, so nice to see you again. I have your sister of my heart, oh, and um, I got it. You know, you got to sign it for me after its release at the Network of Indian Professionals National Conference, San Francisco. So, 25 years old this year, <laughs> right? And so, in that span of time, speaking of sisters, sisterhood, and the role of women. Um, as you can see how um, the role, there's so much more um, power that we can, that we need to have. And have you found that your characters have matured compared to maybe how their roles in this time, 25 years ago, still writing about the past, but the traditional roles that they played, wife, um, mother, sister, and some of those struggles mm -hmm. then, especially from an immigrant lens to your current book today, where um, though I have not yet read it, I wanted to know um, how you feel their, the roles are changing of your women in your stories. Right, that's a great question. Now, independence is a historical novel, right? So we're talking about women uh, in the 1940s, although we will see even within this novel that um, traditional roles break down, they're exploded just because of what's happening in history. When the father is gone, the girls have to take on his role. The father is gone, the mother is in great emotional distress. These girls have to grow up really fast and take on their roles. And the role of, I don't know, um, rescuer, the role of the financial head of the household, the role of the person who strategizes, they become the CEO and the CFO and all of those things. So even here, in that context, there is that change. But certainly in my later books, like um, Before We Visit the Goddess, which is about three generations of women, the grandmother in India, the mother who's the immigrant, and the daughter who lives all her life in this country, you certainly see those older uh, roles breaking down and people having to learn new ways, people embracing new ways of living, and yet the past still is important, it's valuable, we need to connect. How do we connect? These are all questions that the characters ask and sometimes find an answer to. Hi, Professor Dipakini, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I was wondering about what your research process was, especially for a work in historical fiction, um, but also with not just, I mean, the country of India, right? We have such a rich history with it. How do you uh, interweave a nar into a narrative the complex, like, cultural and political histories of a country, of the culture of the land that you're specifically, the state that you're taking place in? Um, what is that process like for you, both researching and then trying to weave that into narrative? You know, my research process changed hugely during COVID, right? Because all of a sudden, before I wrote Independence, I was writing another historical novel. It's titled The Last Queen, and it's about Maharani Jindal, who was the youngest queen of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the great ruler of the Punjab. She becomes queen regent after he dies. She has a little child, and she's fighting very hard to keep the kingdom from the British. Ultimately, she will not succeed because of treachery, all kinds of other things that she can't control. But I, I, I was, I, and she's hugely forgotten by history. I had never read about her until I quite magically came across her. 
Um, that story for another day. But when, and I started this novel, I'm really excited, and COVID strikes, and you know, I can't go to India, I can't access books, I can't go to the places where, for example, she was <coughs> incarcerated by the British, and her son was taken away from her for, you know, decades, or the place where finally mother and son will reunite. I really wanted to, like, experience those. So I turned to paintings and photographs, and they became really important in my historical research. So for this also, I looked at a lot of photographs of that time during independence, during partition, um, wonderful uh, photographs that celebrate the history. The first time the Indian flag is raised in Delhi, there, there are photos of that, but also the terrible, those, the trains that came across the borders with people fleeing and people dying. So I realized that for me, those were really important because those captured the times. If I went today to that prison where Maharani Jinda was incarcerated, it's changed. If I could have gone to like Amritsar, which was important in that, in her life, it has changed. I wouldn't get that feeling. But through those old accounts and those old photographs, thank God for those photographers and old paintings, I really could enter that space. So my um, research, my historical research particularly, has become very visual and is based on visual sources now. And I found that very helpful with this book as well. We're, we're coming toward the end of our time. I should tell you, that Chitra is going back to Houston tomorrow and on Monday leaves for India <clears throat> for the publication of her new book, <laughs> which is nonfiction. It gets my first book of nonfiction. But so I say one question that I've, I've always wanted to ask. Yes. Uh, we who teach literature uh, hold as a tenet of faith that reading, and I believe reading fiction particularly, uh, makes a person ideally more empathic, deeper, better. We, we like to think that reading changes one. What has writing novels for 20 or 30 years and inhabiting all of these characters how has writing fiction changed you? I think it's changed me because it has made me realize everyone's just doing the best they know how to do. You know, it's very rare that people, people's first impulse is, I'm going to destroy your life. That's not the first impulse, although sometimes we like to think so. They're really thinking of, how can I make things better for myself? How can I survive this? How can I you know, deal with my deep angst and the issues that arise from that angst? And as a result, they do certain things. It's not that they're doing it just to make life miserable for, let's say, me. It's just that they don't know how to do it any better. So I think it's just made me deeply compassionate towards not, not just the characters that I write, but I hope people I come across. I mean, we still have to stand up for what we believe in, and if we believe that people are doing things that are harmful for us or our dear ones or our world, we have to do something. Well, we can do it without hate. We can do that knowing that that is what that person knows how to do. I think uh, writing has really taught me to be much less judgmental, to be less coming from here, and at least trying to understand where others are coming from. And with something from the book <coughs> to carry with us all, until incense is burned, it cannot pour out its fragrance. Until the lamp is on fire, 
and cannot give out his life. Thank you for lighting lamps and burning incense, and I, I hope others here can share with me the pleasures of reading your, your next novels and your next, your next book. Please thank Chitra. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz, for inviting me and for this lovely conversation. And thank you to our wonderful audience here today for listening so patiently and asking such wonderful questions. Our time today is at an end, but not really, because through the virtual world, we can carry this forward. I am on social media, people. I am on Facebook, Twitter, and yes, Instagram. <laughs> Please, I hope we will continue the conversation, really. Thank you, and good night.